All right. Well, move to a a cooler classroom with a superior chalkboard, <laughs> and uh, not exactly a classroom, but anyway. <laughs> so I'll see how this works. So, um, as you guys may be aware, um, I've been using my my old lectures, which are really just um, summaries of O'Neill, right? And every so often I add a proof. Um, but we're currently in my lecture 18. Now these are already scanned as PDFs on my website. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to like follow along there, you can do that. Um, but I'm trying to write them all out in here, obviously, you know. Um, but anyway, we're now in chapter six. And chapter six um, of O'Neill is basically uh, just, you know, the theme of chapter six is um, studying surfaces Well, studying surface geometry via frames. All right. And part of the reason I did, did the two examples I did at the start of class today is because we are going to not have an example for a while. Like, we are building a machine. All right. Um, and it's going to take a while to get through this, but at the end of it, we come to a very beautiful theorem by Gauss, um, which is really one of the uh, major accomplishments of this course. It's very cool. Um, so first of all, definition. Well, you remember what a frame was? A frame is a set of three orthonormal vector fields, right? Um, uh, E1, E2, and E3. Um, so b before, we had a frame E1, E2, E3, say vector fields on R3, right? And we assume that those vector fields are, uh, you know, what's the word? Uh, orthonormal, all right? Um, so. This is, this is the frame on R3, right? So, um, definition. An adapted frame Oh, this? Um, I use that symbol for like the set of vector fields on a set. Um, adapted frame on some subset O of M, a surface, um, which of course we're, we're still in R3 at the moment. By the way, in chapter seven, in chapter seven we start thinking about the concept of a Riemann surface. And in chapter seven is where we finally get back to like abstract geometry that we started with, so that's where that happens. Chapter six though is really in some sense, redoing chapter five, except with differential forms. All right. Um, anyway, so adapted frame. Uh, it's just an open set, just like a, a subset of the surface. Um, is a Euclidean frame field well? I'll just say it's a frame field for which. <clears throat> um, E3 at the point P is an element of the normal space um, for all P in the set we're, we're looking at. So, so we, we are assuming here that this frame field as ei dot ej equal to delta ij. So we're assuming it's an orthonormal frame, all right? So our first lemma
lemma 1.2 is that there exists an adapted frame field on O subset of M um, if and only if that set is orientable and there exists a non-vanishing uh, tangent vector field. On, on, on that set. Oh, you, you can sit, you don't have to sit back there. I, I feel like outside. I probably feel like I don't even want to do that to anybody. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's like that. I don't know. I think, I, I think you're fine. I mean, if I could smell anything, you'd smell like beets, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Not, I don't really know. Can you smell like this? What do, what do, I mean, what do beets smell like? I, I don't know. Grass. Grass? Yeah, actually, that sounds right. <laughs> I love that that's the uh, vegetable. They, well, did you guys watch The Office? It's like Dwight Schrute. It's in beet farming, I guess. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> so the proof um, all right, so forward, suppose that there exists an adapted frame field um, on, uh, on on O, right? Well, if there exists an adapted frame field, you know, what's that mean? Then E3 <coughs> of P is, you know, perp is, is perpendicular to the tangent space for all P um, in O, and what does that mean? Well, that means that theta is orientable. Because if you can find a non-vanishing perpendicular uh, field, then that gives you orientability. Essentially, you can think of E3 as the, um, as the unit normal, right? E3 also has length 1. And how about non-vanishing tangent vector field? Well, either E1 or E2 will work for that, right? Because they're perpendicular to E3, and consequently, they must be what? I mean, we're assuming that E1 dot E3 is 0. That means E1 dot E3 is everywhere perpendicular to E3, which must mean that E1 is in the tangent space to P at M for all P. So there's nothing terribly exciting that way. The other direction, um, if you have uh, theta is orientable, and there exists a non-vanishing vector, tangent vector field, right? Suppose that we have theta is orientable. So suppose, you know, u is the unit normal on O. And um, let's say v v of p is an element of tpm for all p and o. And why do I get to do that? 
because that's the lemma, right? It says there exists a non-vanishing tangent vector field, right? So I'm saying there exists a u and a v, right? Um, so how can I make these into a frame field? I mean, I'm, well, we, we have to normalize them, right? So let me not write that down, but it's clear that you could, you could take these, and, and they're non-vanishing, right? We're assuming it's non-vanishing. So since it's non-vanishing without loss of generality, we can normalize these vector fields to have length one, right? So set E3 equal to U and um, E2 equal to V. We've almost got an adapted frame. What, how do we get the third thing in the frame? Cross them, right. So let's see here. We, we, want, we want it to be a right-handed frame. So we want like E1 cross E2 to be E3. So what we need to do is say E1 is E2 cross E3. And so there you go. With that construction, we have E1, E2, E3, an adapted frame field. Okay. And that lemma <clears throat> is, is, is worthwhile because... That's actually how we, we um, sometimes construct a, uh, a frame field. So here's, here's an example um, of that. Well, cylinder, right? So, of course, um, we can take the gradient of x squared plus y squared, and what's that give us? It gives us 2x, 2y, 0, right? And so we can normalize that. E3 is um, 1 over r, x, y, 0. <clears throat> Why does that have, um, why is that a length one vector? So, I'm, I mean, claiming this is. Remember, so the, the, the length of that would be square root of x squared plus y squared divided by r, but x squared plus y squared is r, equal to r squared on the cylinder. So that has length one, right? So there you go, that's a unit normal. And then we, in order to make good on lemma 1.2, to construct an adapted frame field, what we need is a non-vanishing tangent field to the cylinder. So can you guys tell me what's a, what can we use to play the role of V in my, you know, like my proof of lemma 1.2? Y over X. And it's gotta be a vector field though. I want it to be, I want it to be, tan right, so how about this? Like what vector field is the, inter what, what, is this the integral curve for what kind of vector, like the, how about we use like the, the vertical vector field, the, uh, yeah, z hat, right? Like we could let v equal to u3. Is that a tangent vector field to the cylinder? Right. It's plane. Exactly. So, like, I mean, these are um, these are rulings of the cylinder, in fact, and and that's a, a principal vector field for what it's worth. But um, why doesn't it go? All, wouldn't you want the vector field, the tangent vector field, to go all the way around it? Well, the, the, this 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 is the constant vector field. So, like, my picture doesn't. I mean, it's everywhere. Okay. Um, I mean, technically speaking, I want V restricted to the cylinder, you know? So there is, V is U3, right? Yeah. In our usual, you know, O'Neillian notation. And um, so it's U3, right? But U3 we typically think of as being a vector field on all of R3. Yeah. 
at the moment we're thinking about restricting it just to the cylinder. So, okay, so that's going to be that's going to be our quote unquote E2. And then how about what's what's E1 equal to then? Remember it's supposed to be E2 cross E3, which in this case is going to be 1 over r minus y um, x, I think, 0. Certainly that dot products to be 0, and I think that's the right one. Let me think about this. Uh, e2 cross. Do I got I got minus? It says y minus x. Yeah, yeah. I was I was just coming to that. I was I was working out the cross product in my head, and I just, yep, I agree. I mean, that's the that's the only downside of checking dot products, right? You can be off by a sign. So well, in your notes it says e one equal to e three, e two equal to y over r, u one minus x over r, u two e three equal to one over r, x plus y. So you're e two. Um, My E1 is U3? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, there are, I mean, this is the other problem is like you can, the, the, the enumeration might vary. Um, so I'm not, I'm sorry, I have not looked at my notes when I was doing this. I was just doing it. So I said E1 was U3. Mm -hmm. I don't think it changes anything because the cross bar between E1 and E2 is still. Well. The, the trouble is is that we want it so that E1 cross E2 is E3. Mm -hmm. So we have to work with a right-handed frame because there are formulas which depend on this, I think. Um, well, I'll say it this way. If, if I say E1, uh, if I say this is E1, I mean, you could do that, right? But if I do that, then I have to define E2, right? And how would we define E2 then? Right, with, with a cross product, mm -hmm. but what would it be? E2. Yeah, E3 cross E1. So this cross E1, so we get, um, I think I get Y, I get 1 over R. Negative Y. Negative Y? I think I get y, and then minus x, which I think is what I have in the notes, but yeah, y minus x, yeah. So wait, so when you, I'm, I'm messing up the cross product, it's the, it's x, so for the first term, x times 0 minus y times 0? The, fir the first term is this times that minus... Yeah, okay. No, I'm, I'm with you now. Yeah, that's okay. my yeah. I'm just doing cross products in my head wrong. It's all good. Um, so, by the way, these particular vector fields in physics, we would call this, um, like, this is r hat. Yeah. This is z hat. And this guy is, is theta hat. So that's, these vector fields are, uh, you know, system. essentially, yeah. I mean, so the theta hat and the z hat are tangent to the cylinder, and the r hat serves as the unit normal. But together, r hat, theta hat, excuse me, z hat, theta hat, r hat, serves as an adapted frame field to the cylinder. Okay, this is an example. Um, for the, um, you know, you could go through the same for like a sphere is my next example. Um, the adapted 
Uh, I'll just kind of sample sphere. So there we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to, now I remember why I don't like this board. <laughs> x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to r squared. Squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. I know. It just started doing this, but um, in this case, your E3 will be the gradient of this divide, you know, normalized, which is going to be 1 over R XYZ, right? So that's the, that's the, the, the outward pointing, um, you know, unit normal. Now, in terms of spherical coordinates, this is what you'd call row hat, right? So on the sphere, you can, right, so like, right, row hat points spherically outward. There is a phi hat, which points like this in my, in the usual map, and um, theta hat, um, something like that. Let's see here if I can pick another point. Like right here, you've got uh, row hat out like here. Your phi hat points down. And theta hat is like pointing in the equatorial plane directly out as theta sweeps around. So like the formula for theta hat, it's the same as it was up here. And the formula for phi hat is more complicated, but phi hat. Um, so this is E3. Theta hat's a, a, a non-vanishing vector field on most of the sphere. Remember there's a theorem that says there does not exist a non-vanishing tangent vector field to the sphere. At what point does the poles? Poles, yep. So, um, oh yeah, we learned that. That's why you need a patch, right? Yep. So row hat, I'm trying to remember, row hat, phi hat, theta hat is how they're ordered. So like I should make, if that one's E3, if this is 3, then this better be 1, 2, I guess. So I'm thinking theta hat should be like my E2, and phi hat should be my uh, E1, so phi hat would be E th uh, would be row hat cross theta hat for what it's worth. All right. Anyway, um, so the formulas are on page three of um, you know uh, of my. Were you here when I said this? I'm I'm in, I'm in lecture eighteen. This is posted on my website, and um, but. all right. <clears throat> so I hope that's enough for you to get a sense of what we mean by adapted frame field, all right? It's not hard to believe. If you have a surface, you got a unit normal, right? So that gives you E3. Then you just got to find one tangent vector field to the surface, right? And so that's easy enough to do. You just use one of the partial velocities, right? We just use one of the partial velocities, and then that gives you a tangent vector field, right? Then you can't just use the other partial velocity as you're like next adapted frame field because there's no guarantee that they're perpendicular. So um, some special patches like the orthogonal patch has them perpendicular. So in that case, the orthogonal patch, in fact, you can build the adapted frame field most nicely. There's a special section on that later in chapter six. But um, if, it's not an, if it's not an orthogonal patch, then you, you take one of the partial velocities and then you take the cross product of the unit normal with that partial velocity and that gives you another vector field, which is, you know, going to co go together to give you E1, E2, E3, an adapted frame field. So we can find these on a surface, and what do we do with them, right? What do we do with them? <clears throat> well, let me show you.
So theorem. If E1, E2, E3 is an adapted frame on M, then the covariant derivative in the V direction of EI is equal to the sum j equals 1 to 3 of omega ij of v times ej of p, right, for i equals 1, 2, and 3. And all V in TPM. Let's see here. I wonder if that I've, <laughs> I'm a little worried about my use of colors in here. I'm not, oh, it shows up, it shows up. Okay, so um, do you guys remember what the omega ij um, Right, omega ij of v, what was it again? You said covariant of Right, that was our definition for the connection one form, omega ij. Let's see here. So th at the moment, this is just a reminder, really, right? So um, this is a theorem we had before, right? In fact, but what was the difference then? I mean, the difference before was we had this theorem for a frame in R3, right? Yeah, this is a frame in tangent. Right, now, th now this is an adapted frame, right? So. Basically, we're just saying that that theorem, you can restrict it to the surface and it still, still holds. Um, which is why I was talking about the ribbon on the previous page. You can think about taking an adapted frame field and like extending it off the surface in what's called a ribbon. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it kind of gives you a, a mechanism for, for making that restriction. But anyway, I don't think I have much value to add here. We should go on. And... Um, so it brings us to the proposition. Um, let's see here. Now, um, of course, this matters, right? Because this has to do with the shape operator, right? Remember the, I mean, this is going to have to do with the shape operator because E3 is the unit normal, right? And the covariant derivative of the unit normal, that gives us minus the shape operator, right? So we're gonna, this is going to connect back to this shape operator soon. Um, <clears throat> all right. So here's the, the proposition. If 
the shape operator acting on vector v is equal to omega 1, 3 of v e1 at the point p um, plus omega 2, 3 acting on v times e2 at the point p. All right. So, <clears throat> proof, remember that the shape operator acting on V is minus the covariant derivative in the V direction of U, right? But um, <clears throat> for the adapted frame field, E3 is U, right? And then what? Oh, and then I just use, <laughs> I use this theorem right here, right? Now, um, what I'm calling star here is a little bit silly because, well, let me just write it out. So I've got minus omega, let's see here. So I is equal to 3 in this case, right? So we've got minus omega 3, 1 of V, E, the J matches here, right? So E1. minus omega 3, 2 of V, E2 of P. But remember, we proved before that omega ij is equal to minus omega ji. So we, we know from our previous work on the connection coefficients on the connection forms, we know that omega 3, 3 is 0. So that term's gone. All right? Now, does that, does that match, does that match this yet? Why not? Not quite yet, right? What's the difference? 1, 3, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2. So we just, use the property that when we flip we get a minus, the anti-symmetry, right? And, and, and there you go. All right? I'm going to keep the proposition on the board. I'm going to erase the proof shortly, but I need to keep that there because I, I need it later. All right? Actually, I'm going to, well, I'm debating whether or not I should, I guess I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm going to, well, this is the problem of one board. You have to think harder about what you're about to do. No, I think it's okay. I, I, I think, um, it, yeah. So coframe. What's a coframe? So if you have E1, E2, E3 adapted to M, right, then you can get the coframe uh, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, coframe. And what's the rule? Theta upper i, e lower j, 
is Kronecker delta ij, right? This is the so-called dual to the, the adapted frame. Now, since E1, E2, and E3 is adapted to M, this tells us that only E1 and E2, um, you know, tangent to M, right? And so one of the things that in, implies <clears throat> is that when we're looking at, you know, the calculus on M, the theta 3 doesn't actually enter in. The theta 3 is identically 0 on M. So um, on M itself, right, we're, we're trying to describe the intrinsic calculus of the surface. It's kind of our big, big goal here. It's two-dimensional, right? So E1 and E2 serve as a, tan as a basis for the tangent space. So we don't, we don't need theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. We just need the theta 1 and theta 2. The theta 3, um, it doesn't change um, on the surface, actually. Okay, so <clears throat> in short, just to give you a um, synopsis here, we have theta 1, theta 2, dual, to E1 and E2. And, um, you know, just to, I feel like I s missed a, no, it's fine, it's fine. So this, this comment right here is, 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 for, is it's forward looking. We haven't proved what I'm about to say here. This is what we're going to learn in the next page or two, um, which is that omega 1, 2, um, we're going to see omega 1, 2 describes how E1 rotates into E2 and vice versa, all right? In the same way that the uh, curvature, remember the curvature and the torsion for the Frenet frame, they describe how the, the T and B frame rotate amongst themselves. Well, that's what omega-1-2 is like. It's in the same sense. It's telling us how the frame evolves to the frame. In contrast, the omega-1-3 and the omega-2-3, um, omega these have to do with the, you know, um, these, have, these have to do with how E3, I think, excuse me, um, well, I say they capture the shape operator given by E3, essentially. These have to do... I'll just say they, they tell us something about the shape operator. In fact, that's already, this proposition is what this says. I mean, this proposition right here says that, right? See that? Shape operator is given by one, omega-1-3 one, and omega-2-3, right? There's no omega-1-2 in this. Um, examples? Well, an example here. I say for this for the cylinder that we had up, right? Um, theta one. You can say dr theta two is r d theta, and theta three oh eh. oh I'm sorry. What we're looking at here is a translation. <laughs> Oh man, this is bad. So I'm a victim of my own notes. Like my my my, I think I'm referring back to a previous example in the notes where I had I had ordered the um, the coframe according to a particular order. Like we looked at the cylindrical coframe, but the thing is, the enumeration doesn't match the adapt the adapt like the adapted nomenclature, because for a cylinder, r is constant, right? So that makes this theta one kind of like theta three. So um, what I'm trying to warn you is if we go back to earlier in the notes, I didn't, I didn't care about the adapted idea, right? So it wasn't necessarily the case that the third thing in the co-frame was what it should have been to match up with the adapted. So <clears throat> anyway, to fix this, um, I think we should just say what? Theta 1 is... Well, I guess it depends on what our, um, 
it depends on what our, um, man, my notes are, my notes are not helping me at the moment. <laughs> so you guys remind me here, what did we have for E1 and E2 and E3 for the cylinder? We just did. E1 was Z hat. Yeah, Z hat or U3. And E2 was R. Uh, 1 over R, Y minus X0, Y negative X0. Um, oh, goodness gracious, this is like a heavy lift on the fly. <laughs> so, like, I need to translate this, guys, from like y over r, partial partial x, minus x over r, partial partial y, and, you know, this is x over r, partial partial x, plus y over r, partial partial y, in terms of like the chain rule and switching to polar coordinates, what is what what's going on here? I mean, the first one's easy. That's partial partial z, right? Hey, <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but what what about these guys? Did you say the radius is constant? That is true. Uh, the radius is constant, but um, I'm, my, my question is, in terms of cylindrical coordinates, what are these partial differential operators? See, um, so like, I believe that <clears throat> partial x, uh, partial theta is what? Cosine. Yeah, it's cosine. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Partial, partial theta of R cosine theta, right? That's X. Yeah. So that should be minus, and it's, it's big R here because of the context, but um, minus R sine theta, right? So, dang it, that is not what I want. <sighs> I'm most annoyed. What I was hoping for here. Well, that makes sense if you get R sine theta, cosine uh, theta, or R cosine theta z. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, this is this is why. You're going from cylinder. Yeah, but I've got I got a I got a sine error here. I mean, this is like minus. So I got a one over r in total, right? Mm -hmm. This is that y. So I've got like minus partial x, partial theta, partial partial x. And this is. I'll put the minus out front. So I've got partial x, partial theta, partial theta, plus partial y, partial theta, partial, partial y. Because partial y, partial theta is our cosine theta, right? But our cosine theta is x. That's the x. The r comes out. And so the point is, this is straight up partial, partial theta. But what I have is an extra sign that I wasn't hoping for. I got minus 1 over r, partial, partial theta, if I haven't made a mistake here. So I'm not sure if the previous example has a mistake in it or if there just is a minus here. Are you getting a partial, partial theta? Chain rule. So partial, so just the chain rule. And like this one. Uh, wouldn't that be too partial? No, no, chain rule. And this one here. 
partial uh, x over r, this is, this is, that is straight up cosine, right? So that is actually partial x, partial theta, um, partial partial x, plus partial y, partial theta, partial, not theta, partial r. Goodness gracious. Partial x, partial r. Anyway, all I'm trying to, let me just erase all this mess. My point, that I'm taking entirely too long to make, is that this is one, minus 1 over r partial partial theta. And I believe that this is partial partial r, little r. And so with those, like, the, my, my point about this is just that if you have it that way, it's really easy to see what the coframe is. So the coframe, you know, theta 1 is dz. The coframe theta 2 is um, apparently minus r d theta. And this one, theta 3, of course, is dr. But on the cylinder, this is what? If we have r equal to the constant big R, right? That's identically zero. It's just that this minus here is bothering me. It makes me feel like there's a systematic error in either the previous example or our current one. But. No, I mean, the, 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 how do you find the coframe is the question, right? If you have, if you, you know, if you have the chord that's like set up like that, it's really easy. Otherwise, you have to like kind of think through how do you convert from, you know, how do you find the dual to the, the vector? It's got to be, you have to think about how to solve these equations up here, right? These equations fix what the dual vector looks like. Um, all right. I was, yeah, well, on six, but again, I don't quite trust this. Okay. Um, I mean, well, let me say it this way. I trust what's on page six more than what I did here. I think that there's probably an error in the earlier example with the, the y's and the x's. Or at least, maybe there's not an error. Maybe we're just trying to... Um, merge two interpretations which have different starting points. So um, anyway, 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 let me just collect our thoughts here. Summary, summary, summary. So coframe to cylinder. R equals to big R, right? We have theta 1 is um, R d theta, and theta 2 is dz. A coframe to sphere. Um, which would be, of course, rho equals to r. And there you've got theta 1 equals to r d phi. And theta 2 is r sine phi d theta. And what I'm saying on page 6 here is that if you go back to our earlier work on setting up the coframe for the um, cylindrical or spherical coordinate system, if you just if you freeze out for the cylinder the radial coordinate, you set it r equal to a constant, or in the spherical case, if you freeze out the spherical radius, you drop back to these coframes, right? And they are dual. They are dual to like E1 being 
um, theta hat and E2 being, in this case, Z hat. And here, these are dual to E1 being phi hat and E2 being um, theta hat. Must be theta hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm making too much of production out of this. And... All right, all right, all right. So this brings us to Carton's I'm sorry, I should have, uh, you know, I was reading notes for class today. I was focused too much on the theorems, and I neglected to think through. We've calculated this stuff before. I need to find where I've calculated it before and specifically get it so we can reference it and use it again, rather than, like, reinventing. Reinventing the wheel here is going through, like, all of the mechanics of cylindrical and spherical coordinates and how the derivatives relate to the differentials and, we could do that, but it would take me all of class time to do it properly. Um, so I, I'm sorry about that, but moving along here. So these are Carton's structure equations adapted to M. So what were Carton's structure equations before? What was the, what was the, like the nicest way to write them? So, yeah. In short, they are d theta is omega wedge theta, right? And d omega is Omega wedge omega, that's what you should find. So those, remember what those are those? Those are matrix equations, right? Yes. Um, well, theta is a vector of one forms, right? And um, omega is a matrix. So this is like a matrix of one matrix this is a matrix of two forms. That is a matrix of two forms. This is a uh, column vector of two forms. And this is also a column vector of two forms that's formed by a matrix times a column vector. So there's, there's this interplay between the exterior derivative and usual matrix multiplication that's, it's, uh, you know, it's all nice and dandy. And, but <clears throat> when, we, when we look at Carton structure equations applied to an adapted frame on M, right, then some things happen. So, first of all, you know, we've got d theta 1 is omega 1, 2 wedge theta 2. We have d theta 2 is omega 2, 1 wedge theta 1. Um, and d theta 3, what's that? Well, that's straight up 0, right? That's 0 because theta 3 is 0 in the adapted frame, right? But it's also equal to, um, oh, I'm an idiot. What? Okay, well, it's, it's equal to omega wedge theta, right? Oh, goodness gracious. All 
All right, so that would be, I, you know, um, remember how this works. This is omega 3, 1, wedge theta 1, plus omega 3, 2, wedge theta 2. So um, because theta 3 is identically 0, we just get this is equal to 0. So these first two, I say these are the first structural equations. This is just a bunch of name calling. But um, these are the first structural equations. This second one is called the symmetry equation. All right. And then unpacking. So at the moment, I have not used the d omega one, right? These are all just unpacking, specializing that first structural equation to the context of an adapted frame. So we're just using what we did before in this in, restricted to an adapted frame. That, that's all. Um, the second one, right, this here, this gives us um, a few different things. It gives us that um, d omega 1, 2 is omega 1, 3 wedge omega 3, 2. This is called Gauss's equation. All right, but you can get more out of this. You can also get the Kodazi equations, which are d omega 1, 3 is omega 1, 2 wedge omega 2, 3, and um, d omega 2, 3 equals omega 2, 1 wedge omega 1, 3. So these, these last two here, these are called the Kadazi equation. Again, there's really nothing to prove here because we already proved the structural equations before. And we're doing nothing but just saying those equations still hold when you restrict to, to a surface. And some of them are zero because of the adapted frame. Right. And, okay, so now that we have these, we can calculate the connection form. So this is very neat, because now we're in the position to calculate the connection form for like a cylinder or a sphere using these, right? We can use the structure equations to calculate the, um, you know. So I will make myself some room here. Poor planning on my part. <laughs> question. Is that the same Gauss from like physics? Yep. It is that it is the Gauss. <laughs> Both for him to sphere. Uh, yeah. So he just jumped around or did he use this for physics? Um, well this was used for physics eventually, but not at the time. As far as I know. I mean later. Um, you know, when Einstein came back to try to, you know, invent his theory of general relativity. And, you know, he needed mathematics for it. That mathematics had already been done, and that mathematics grew out of what we're doing. Not really this so much as the outgrowth of Chapter 7. Um, everything here still is ultimately married to the Euclidean geometry of three dimensions. We're going to get away from that by the end of lecture today, but 